Hello, everyone. Welcome to this month's uh, SBE DASG panel discussion, New Technology in the Energy Industry. Very excited for this one. This will be our first hybrid event. So we do have some people in the room and also have some of us, uh, some joining us on the web. Uh, for those that are on the web, welcome, welcome. Um, just uh, some housekeeping right quick. Uh, we are going to uh, go through the panel discussion. Uh, I'll be uh, emceeing the event and uh, asking the questions, and then the panel will be answering these questions. And then um, at, you will be also able to uh, submit Q&A through the app itself. So um, there is a question panel that you can click and then uh, write in your questions. After the event is over, um, the panel themselves will receive the questions and they will reach out to you uh, with answers. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. We'll go ahead and go around the room and let everyone introduce themselves. Michael, if you'll go ahead and start, please. Hey, howdy folks, I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I've only been doing this for about four years. Um, I do teach and conduct research with a team of 15 PhD students on spatial subsurface data analytics, geostatistics, and machine learning. Now, I mentioned the fact I've only been doing this for a little while. I did spend 13 years from my PhD working in Chevron's energy technology company, specifically in the same field, the practice application up to leadership positions before I left and joined the university. So I'm very excited about this topic and happy to discuss with you all today. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, ben, your turn. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ronnie. Thank you, Dr. Perch. Always good working with you. And thank you, Dr. Caputo. This is an exciting time. Uh, my name is Ben Amaba. I'm the IBM Chief Technology Officer for Industrial and Engineering Area. Uh, most of my writings, authorships, or research is primarily in the area of industrial systems and software engineering across chemical and petroleum, discrete auto, aero, uh, and uh, in areas like overall equipment effectiveness, supply chain management, uh, capital facilities, and health and safety. But again, thank you for having us here today, and I'm very excited to talk about this topic. Great. Thank you, Ben. Very excited to have you as well. And finally, last but not least, Graciela. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm also very happy to be here today. Uh, I am Graziella. Uh, I have a PhD in artificial intelligence. Uh, in, I mean, before I worked uh, in many industries, uh, but uh, it was mostly in oil and gas, uh, where uh, I was applying data science uh, on uh, geophysical data, and uh, it was something very interesting. Uh, I've been on IBM for two years and a half now, and uh, I am currently manager in this team that we call the DSE, uh, Data Science and AI Elite Team, where uh, we try to solve, uh, we try to understand the client's pain issue and uh, try to formulate the problem and uh, solve it uh, using uh, data science. And uh, uh, my focus is especially on the industry, and uh, I've been working uh, a lot with manufacturers and supply chain and uh, oil and gas case like drilling, production, uh, helping them to uh, 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 with uh, uh, related uh, uh, data that uh, can be solved using artificial intelligence. So that's my uh, my zone. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you. Very happy to have you here as well. All right, well, let's go ahead and start off with the first question. Uh, I'll go ahead and ask the question, and then we'll go in order, the same order that I started off with here, and then we'll kind of switch it up after a while. Okay, so the first question again, any suggestions or ideas on how to get by a buy-in to replace existing manual workflows with data science and potentially automated workflows? Michael, please start. All right. Um, my feedback would be that um, our decisions we make are are very different from the decisions of say a Spotify recommender engine, which is trying to pick the next song you should listen to. We have high value, complicated, expensive decisions in our industry. We can't trust the black box. What we need is, if we want to automate things, is we need very good diagnostics. We need to understand how the machine is performing. We need to understand why the machine is making specific decisions. And when we build our workflows, we need to really stress test them. 
to test them across a wide range of different applications so we can gain our confidence in working with these methodologies. But what does this all mean? In general, I think we'll be driven to going to less complexity and simpler workflows to improve interpretability or using methodologies like Shapley value where we can do some type of interpretation or diagnostics after the fact on the model. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, you know, I think, how are we gonna make this transition and will it happen? I think there's actually three elements here that we've got to assess uh, each use case in institution or each technology. And they're the following three. I think we've got to figure out, do we have a legitimate reason? And that reason generally uh, surrounds itself with either time, we're trying to compress time. The second one, we're trying to optimize resource. Maybe we have limited resource. Or another one, we're trying to raise service level quality or any combination of the three. I, so I think the ability to find a reason to move is very, very important before we even start the journey. The second one I always find is readiness. Even if we have a reason to move, are we ready to do that? Meaning, do we have management support or leadership support? Are our employee base, our engineers, our mathematicians, are they ready to take that next step? And the third one in the second category is, do we have a well-documented decision process? Because if we don't have all those three in readiness, we're not ready to go. And the final one is resource. Uh, we can be have a reason, we can be ready, but if we don't have the resource, let's just be honest, we don't have the money, if we don't have the talent, and we don't have the technology infrastructure, it becomes very difficult to even get started. So again, I believe if we have a good reason, if we are ready and we have the resource, we can make that transition. And I think those three are more uh, major determinants than even some of the use cases, geography, or even industry that we play in. Thank you, Ben. Graciela? Graciela, you're muted. Yeah. Uh, so I was saying that it's hard to be uh, the last one to answer because uh, they have such nice insights. And I'm like, uh, OK, I kind of just want to repeat. So I'm going to add the one point here. Uh, which uh, I feel that uh, many times we have the good idea, we have the business, but uh, we don't have the data. So uh, before, uh, in the very beginning, in the conception of the company itself, uh, I, for example, when I talk with startups, I always recommend to start saving the data and organizing the data. And uh, uh, especially in oil and gas, uh, we know that uh, uh, data is in silos and sometimes it's so hard to combine them. And uh, we just lose track of uh, who uh, uh, changed the data and uh, why, why they changed the data. There are a lot of processing. And uh, uh, so uh, having a good uh, governance of the data is also important as well. So uh, before that, uh, it's, uh, I mean, it, I feel that this is the foundation of uh, uh, data science. Thank you, good points, good points for sure. Um, for the next question, we'll start off with Ben and then go to Graciela and then Michael. Um, how is our industry preparing its personnel for the new technologies and ideas? Are colleges revamping their curriculum to account for more unconventional and data science topics to prepare new graduates? Are companies in the industry having to handle the majority of it via on-the-job training or supplemental education? You know, that is a fantastic question because I will tell you, in the last five years, everything is just spawned. Not only the instructors who have the domain knowledge sharing it, and I got to give a plug for uh, Michael because he's got a blog site that he shows all of his material, but uh, online education, right, is huge right now. In fact, almost every college curriculum either has a certification program, a graduate degree, or even a research center. Now, so academia is pursuing it online, in face, with certification programs, as well as graduate programs. I think uh, professional societies. Professional societies actually now have committees and work groups, just like yourself today, and you've also got an analytics within SBE around the globe. So I see professional so societies out there. 
uh, government is doing the same by giving NSF grants because they really feel this is a competitive advantage. And of course, companies like IBM are ac actually offering as part of our IBM academic initiative courses and access to the technology and resources and actually models that you can prototype. So I think it's coming from four major lanes. I think it's coming from academia. I think it's coming from industry. I think it's coming from government. And I think it's coming from professional societies. And what was interesting, I saw a survey specifically on data analytics, machine learning and artificial intelligence. The individuals that are taking the class will say 40 to 60% of them didn't do it because their employees, employers said do it or their institution. They did it just out of pure interest and trying to position themselves for the future. So do I see it coming? Absolutely. And uh, the two individuals I'm on right now with right now, they're advocates. Again, uh, Michael was with me, flew in from Texas to Atlanta to share his knowledge with the uh, Institute for Industrial and Systems Engineers. And again, this is a panel, which is a perfect example that the information and knowledge is becoming bilateral. Consumers are consuming it, and the people that are delivering an origin, uh, uh, creating the origin for it, are actually uh, part of the ecosystem. So I'm very happy to see what's going on in the world today. Now, I think, uh, Ben, we can all, all of us in the room can agree with you on that. Uh, and then being a part of a group like this and those of us attending, that's what we're all striving for as well, is, is, is gaining knowledge because it's knowledge that we're trying to, trying to gain from this. Um, okay, Graciela, you're next. Uh, yeah, um, so uh, one thing that I wanted to add here, I mean, on the top of everything that Ben said, uh, I, I totally agree with you, Ben. And uh, what I also feel is that uh, a lot of people, uh, they are already in their uh, positions. They are uh, experts on uh, some subject, uh, which uh, it could be uh, engineering or uh, petroleum. And they have the interest of uh, learning these new technologies. So I feel that these people are the ones that the company should be investing on. Uh, they should be uh, bringing them to the projects and learn with the data scientists and eventually call them data scientists. Because uh, I've seen so many uh, SMEs that uh, learn to code by themselves just because they are interested and they do amazing uh, Calls. They do amazing machine learning models because they understand the data. It's not only a get a table and uh, insert into an algorithm and get the output. No, they know the transformations that need to be done. They know how the data have to be combined and they know what they are looking for. So uh, I feel that uh, uh, if the companies invest in these people that are interested, and uh, I feel that they will gain much more. And of course, provide uh, education for them and the time to learn as well, because uh, sometimes they are so busy with other tasks that uh, they uh, really don't have uh, uh, much time to learn this. And then they hire from, um, uh, from outside where they could potentially have the talent just sitting there already hired and eager to, to learn. Oh, yes, I totally agree with that as well. Um, it's so funny. A lot of times when you uh, when you meet a data scientist in the industry, a lot of times they're, oh, I was an engineer and got interested to it. Now, now they label me as a data scientist. Or I was a geologist for so many years, and, and now yeah. I'm a data scientist. You hear that so much. Exactly, yes. Oh, no, definitely. Thank you, thank you. And finally, Michael? All right, um, let me just uh, echo what everyone's been saying and support it. I visit a lot of different energy companies and every organization I visit is talking about working on the problem of the digital revolution. What are we doing about data science, data analytics, machine learning? Now, as Ben said, and Ben, thank you very much for the plug, I appreciate that. I am committed as a professor in the University of Texas at Austin, I do feel that I have a role of service to the state of Texas and beyond. And so what I've done is I give away all of my university content freely on my YouTube channel and on my GitHub account. Anyone who's interested can join in, log in, and learn the fundamentals of statistics, data analytics, going to advanced deep learning. And I provide a lot of nice, well-documented workflows so you can follow along. It's all on GitHub, available for you. About 20,000 people join that every, um, every month, which is really exciting. I get a lot of great feedback from working professionals. Now, what else is going on? Our department, Petroleum Engineering, um, at the 
school, we have revamped our curriculum. Uh, we taught geostatistics. I teach that course now, and it's data analytics and geostatistics. I've changed it, modernized it. We're using modern open source code to get the job done. We have new graduate courses in machine learning, and I teach that also. And I have to say, a really funny email I got, it was from a chemical engineer who said, I looked all over the university campus for a good machine learning course that would suit me. I was so surprised to find it in petroleum. And my response to them was, didn't you know we've always been high tech? Didn't you know we've been the ones who've been driving data science anyway? So I was, I'm really excited about these great opportunities to share. I've taught 1,700 working professionals in 44 engagements last year alone. And I get tons of emails and what I'm learning is this, engineers and geoscientists in our field learn very well these new concepts in data science and, and in short term are adding new value with these new skills. So I'm very, very excited as I, and I think we're ready to face this challenge. Can I add one point here? Definitely. <laughs> Which made me uh, remind that uh, many times working with a geologist and geophysicist, uh, and uh, then we would face some, uh, some software or something that we needed to improve and they were like, I was already doing artificial intelligence 20 years ago, but they didn't call that a science, <laughs> but they did. And it's true. So a lot of people can call themselves that a scientist. We are the original data scientists. Yeah. <laughs> no, definitely. It is kind of funny when you start talking about a lot of this stuff and it seems very similar to things that have been done, you know, in the past may, you know, may not have, carried as much of the weight, of, you know, or some of the sophistication that, that that's here currently, but you do see a lot of a, a lot of those things, a lot of the remnants of that, that, that just kind of echo along. Totally agree. Okay, anyone else want to insert anything else before we go on to the next question? Okay, the next one. Has there been more success in a partial part of the industry? For example, upstream versus downstream versus midstream. We'll go ahead and start off with Graciela and then go on to Michael and then Ben. Yeah, uh, I feel this is a very tricky question because it really depends. I mean, depends on the level of maturity of uh, uh, the organization, but uh, also I feel it depends on how much they invested on technologies and the uh, data organization, uh, if uh, the data is still sitting on silos or uh, or if it's already organized, uh, where uh, you have a seismic, for example, uh, combined with a well log, can you just put up them together to take some decision? Many times you can't. So, uh, so I, I feel that uh, uh, I've seen more in uh, on on the production side, on the uh, exploration side, but I'm kind of biased here because uh, it's more where I worked before. So yeah, I I will pass this question to Michael uh, and Ben because uh, yeah, that's that's my uh, my uh, where I've worked on. <laughs> yeah, I think for all of us we're pretty pretty much into uh, partial to to where we've been. So no, I agree with that. If if we were playing the prices right, I would actually bid one dollar above your answer. Because I, I think you were there. I think you nailed it. I think that's exactly where I want to go to. And that is the difference I see within organizations and between organizations has to do with the culture of the organization. I go to companies where I show up and I teach with a whole bunch of Jupyter notebooks you know, on the cloud. And I have a bunch of open source packages, including the package that I've developed in Geostats. And I teach from that. And I'll have companies who are immediately that afternoon, they're prototyping ideas and deploying and sharing it throughout the company. And then I have other companies that I go and meet with and, I, and I, I show them that and they go, no, no, we can't. We need to, that'll be very difficult for us to bring into the organization and we need a lot of review. They're more isolated from the world's brilliance. And, and I'll tell you what, I think we've reached the point where we need to join as a community. We need to look outside of our organizations. If we do that, we can quickly ad adopt these new value adding technologies. They're available. Oh, that's amazing insight. Yeah, I think 
I, I yeah, I totally agree with that. I think it depends on the organization a lot and and, and where it is applied and, and the people inside of it. Uh, ben, would you like to add to that? You know, I'm gonna add that other dollar too, right? Uh, I totally agree with them. And, and I'll revisit the first question or the response to the first question. Uh, globally around the world, when you look at large number, whether it's midstream, downstream, or upstream, they're kind of uniform. And again, when I ask them the three questions, do you have a reason? Uh, are you ready? And do you have the resource? When they say yes to all these questions, which by the way, anybody on this call or in physically in the room can go to informs.org and you can ask actually ask those questions of yourself. And it's got a Likert scale of one to five. So that's available. Like uh, Mike was saying, it's being democratized. So that's one thing. If they uh, have a reason, they're ready, and they have the resource. But I wanted to add one more uh, corollary to that. What I also see on the success of this, and Deming and Duran saw this in other industries, that 85 to 94% of the most successful uh, areas or where the flaw was, was in the process. That means they might have understand a little bit or an element, but they didn't understand the encompassing process, either the work in the field or in the geosciences or the process to attack the problem. If that is true, they actually develop something called the job task analysis. And this is very prescriptive that everybody can walk away with. If you do the assessment, again, reason, readiness, and resource, and you can frame it uh, from a process, describe what you're doing in a process, the probability of being successful, whether you're downstream, midstream, or upstream, skyrockets. So if you walk away from anything I've said, the discipline of process and understanding what you're doing in a systematic way. Why do I love geosciences engineers? Because they're already built that way. They're trained and disciplined. So looking at the forensics, instead of asking who was successful, we need to ask why they were successful. Oh, no, yeah, that's totally great insight. I, I think uh, a lot of uh, planning and, and organizing beforehand and understanding what you're trying to accomplish, I think is a big part of it as well, for sure, definitely. Okay, and on to the next question. This time we'll go uh, Michael, Graciela, and then Ben. Uh, have these successes been more of a new out of the box idea or just improvements of existing tools, equipment, et cetera, things that we already have? I, I'm gonna probably make a mistake here and sound low tech. But let me just go ahead, I'm gonna dive in. Fundamental statistics and data analytics. People doing a better job of understanding and working with their big data sets has been huge. And I'm seeing that all over the place where people are learning new things from the pat patterns within the data. Now that doesn't necessarily mean deep learning or very complicated methods. These can be good statistical data analytics practice like every single time you produce a number, Think about significance, quantify significance, look at uncertainties, propagate it all the way through. Okay, what have I seen? The, the kind of the interesting feedback cycle from this is that when we've done that, it's resulted in greater pull for data management, data curation. And so we've done a better job analyzing the data. Now we're gonna do a better job of collecting, gathering, and curating the data. And I've seen this really great positive feedback that started there. Okay, so I, I think this has been a major um, change and benefit value adding activity within our, our organizations. Um, actually, it's funny, Michael, while you were saying that, there was a lot of nod, head nodding going on the, around the room in here. So uh, I think everyone totally agrees with that. Um, I know a few of us uh, a few years back were involved in, in an exercise with uh, the company we were with and the first major thing was like, uh, let's let's start off with basic stats and understanding it, because that's the building block, and then going from there. So it was funny. You, you had people, the engineers, most of the engineers were kind of comfortable with it, and then we brought, not not to knock anybody, we brought the geologists in. They're like, man, I got to relearn all this stuff again. <laughs> so yeah. that's where we went with it. So it was kind of funny. So Graciela. Uh, yeah. Um, I feel that the. Uh, there is a combination of both. Uh, there is like uh, the part where uh, we have these new technologies and uh, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Uh, Michael said. And uh, uh, and there are things that was not possible to be done before. For example, to analyze a seismic uh, 
10 years ago, it would be like almost impossible to try to, for example, uh, automatically detect uh, a horizon, for example, and not because uh, uh, the intelligence was not there. As I said before, uh, the algorithm was already there and uh, the smart people were already there, but uh, they couldn't do because the data was all in tapes, right? So now we can put this data in the cloud. And uh, also we have uh, uh, equipments that are getting better too. Like uh, uh, nowadays we can uh, get information in real time while drilling, right? And uh, we can uh, uh, take decision while drilling. Uh, if uh, we see that some uh, that uh, maybe we have a stuck pipe, we can get uh, uh, the operation to stop before the stuck pipe because now we have uh, the equipment uh, uh, with so many IOTs uh, that. Uh, Nowadays, we can uh, use this. So uh, I feel that uh, uh, both parts are uh, getting better. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, definitely. That, I think that's great. Yeah. Um, you know, we can we can sit here and, and dream about it and, and try to plan about it. But if the technology and, and everything else doesn't keep up with it, then there's nowhere else to go with it. Definitely agree. OK, Ben, you want to finish that yeah. up? Uh, you know, there's not much I can add to this, but I do want to add two things that I learned uh, from Dr. Michael Perch, Graziella, and Dr. Andre Popa from Chevron. Uh, one of the things I noticed in Atlanta when Dr. Perch was speaking, he talked about the paradigms. And the question is, hey, did this come overnight or was it built over a series of events? Mm -hmm. uh, I like what uh, Michael said at the conference last week. He goes, we were in paradigm one, moving to paradigm two, three, and four. So you didn't throw out the uh, baby with the bathwater. It has been building over time, and you were the original founders of this audience. So you should continue to build. And, and what Dr. Popo also pointed out to me, uh, although IBM talked about it in 1958 through 1965, he was doing this in the 70s and 80s, specifically, you know, four type of artificial intelligence, neural networks, case-based reasoning, fuzzy logic, and the genetic algorithm. You guys, in uh, probably in different terminologies, attempted to do that. Now that neural networks are getting very popular, now we're moving over to fuzzy logic. But it all came from your fundamental statistical analysis. So what do a lot of experts say that they're trying to build on on the oil and gas industry? And that's why I think you're ahead of most industries, whether it be retail and banking. You started using data to actually describe the situation, i.e. geosciences. Then you started diagnosing those, right? Why is it what it is? Now, people talk about uh, predicting it, right? Which is the next layer over, and then prescribing it, which is machine learning and artificial intelligence. I can almost bet you, and uh, again, Michael, I'm plagiarizing on you. When he did a survey saying, how many of you guys are really big data scientists? And he went through this systematic evaluation. We found that everybody in some form or fashion with the fundamentals was halfway to the journey. So I thought that was very interesting to this question. Did it, it was it all of a sudden a magic burst or has it been incrementally climbing? And I think it's been incrementally climbing. I mean, there's things like uh, the quantum computer that might have made a difference or network Metcalf's law uh, with networks with Netflix or even Microsoft natural language proce processing. But it had to be built on paradigms one, two and three prior to that. Great insight, thank you. Um, so the next question, and we'll start off with Ben and then go Michael and Graciela. Uh, what is an example of technology solving a problem efficiently in your mind? What made it efficient or effective? Uh, great, in fact, two large deals uh, for IBM just closed. One is in the Middle East for a stuck pipe that Graciela was talking about, and then another one for pipe specifications up in the Nordics. Uh, very efficient, very effective. And now I'm going back to questions number one and three. What did they have? They had a reason, they were ready, and they had a resource. But more importantly, both, one dealing with a stuck pipe in the Middle East and one dealing with pipe specification in the Nordics, all had a disciplined approach. They could talk about agile, but it was all the way down to the work breakdown structure. They had measurements for the materials, machinery, manpower. They use techniques like critical success factor, fishbone diagram, uh, performance evaluation review techniques. They were using this in traditional analog systems and they could move it over. So what's in my mind today, fresh in my mind, the uh, ability to solve the stuck pipe problem in the Middle East where 
they have very tumultuous environments. And then in the Nordics, right, with the freezes and the weather, all doing the same thing, a common cause. Again, they had a reason, readiness, resource, and they had a very disciplined approach. They didn't throw away the fundamentals and the statistical analysis, but they were able to reuse it, not only to describe, diagnose, but predict and use machine learning to say, what's my best options? Thank you, Ben. I bet that would be very interesting to read about. Uh, Michael? So I'm going to be a little bit less applied, and I'll talk more in generalities. The world is an ugly place. It's not linear. It's not Gaussian. It's not homoscedastic. It is complicated. It is chaotic. And it turns out that many of the methodologies we used before made those gross assumptions. It's like we were trying to put a round peg into a square hole. What we have now is we have all kinds of new opportunities, new data science tools coming online that are more flexible to work with our ugly data, to work with our non-linearity, to work for our non-Gaussianity, and to work with our heteroscedasticity and so forth. And so I, I think about, I get really excited. When I teach students correlation analysis, we don't stop with the correlation coefficient and covariances. We go on to partial correlation. We talk about information theory and mutual information. These are general measures that can work with our ugly data in a very flexible manner, and they're very accessible to us. And so I get really excited about that. People used to do principal components all the time for dimensionality reduction. Consider methodologies like multidimensional scaling, more flexible methods that don't make those same types of you know, simplifying assumptions. And then finally, I get very excited. Our industry is no stranger to ensemble common filtering. It's been used for a long time to do history matching. I have a PhD student who's just developed and published on GAN, Generative Adversarial Network Assisted Ensemble Kalman Filtering. What's beautiful about that? The machine learning takes care of the ugliness and the summarization and, and the dimensionality reduction, and it prepares us so that the ensemble common filtering can actually work much better than it has before. So I get I get really excited to me. Uh, to me, it means we can deal with our ugly data. That's amazing. I, I think that would be another interesting read. I've got a couple of things to look at. All right, Graciela, your turn. Yeah, I love it. I actually would like to hear more about this. <laughs> Do you have any class online uh, talking more about this? It would be very interesting. <laughs> I love it. Uh, so I'm going to answer the question a little bit uh, differently. Uh, uh, I thought I think it was more generic, like uh, new technologies, and not specifically in data science. So uh, my answer is out of my comfort zone. So maybe that's why I think it's so amazing. I love 3D printing. I really love it. The things that the industry is being able to do with 3D printing, uh, they are being able to prototype and uh, doing things so much faster because they can uh, create uh, some some object that they need just there. For example, if uh, they are in the uh, in a platform, for example, and uh, if some equipment breaks, and uh, we know it costs millions of dollars to to stop an operation for one day. But if they have the 3D print in there, they can just print the, the object that broke. And uh, there are like material that uh, it's uh, extremely uh, resistant to heat. So uh, for me, uh, this technology is the one that it's more like, wow, this is uh, something that was uh, really missing. Wow, that's amazing. I did, I've never heard that, that they've actually been doing 3D printing out there. That's really cool. Okay, and for the final question, uh, we'll start with Graciela, go to Michael, and then Ben will round this out. Um, what are the challenges you see with using data science to solve problems? Hmm. Well, starting with data, as uh, I've said before, uh, but uh, there is also the, the culture of the company. Uh, if people don't embrace, and especially uh, higher management, uh, uh, it has to come from uh, the C level, uh, where uh, they want to, to adopt and uh, go through the digital transformation. And uh, this is an expensive uh, process, right? And it's like, it's long, it could take 
years for a company to uh, to go halfway through the journey. So uh, they really have to uh, to start thinking about this, and uh, also uh, because. Uh, by the end of the day, uh, having this, uh, uh, this digital transformation will help them to be more resilient uh, in case, uh, for example, uh, something that uh, we wouldn't predict, for example, like COVID. If you have data organized and the data driven decision, it's easier to adapt to uh, uncertainties than if uh, uh, everything is just uh, randomly and uh, you still doing communications through email only and make decisions uh, just through um, through the normal channels. So uh, that's what I feel that uh, uh, it needs to change is the, uh, is the uh, culture and also the, the collaboration between uh, the employees as well. Like, uh, for example, nowadays we have a cloud uh, that employees can just work together in the same code and not uh, because I know that a lot of people just do their model in their own computer, right? And then they deploy the model someplace, but it was always just sitting there computer. So uh, that's that's one of the main challenges that I see. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think that is a challenge that we all, some, most a lot of us face is, is that kind of thing in our own industries, our own companies. Uh, Michael? Energy is unique. We're different than almost everyone else when it comes to working with data. We have very complicated, massive populations to work with the subsurface. We have very sparsely sampled data. I tell my students, we sample directly one trillionth volumetrically of the reservoir, maybe 100 billionth if we're in unconventionals. We also deal with high value decisions very, very expensive decisions, and we have uncertainty everywhere. It's ubiquitous. Okay, so now our situation is so unique and so different. And what we need to do is so uh, challenged. What I find is that many of the data science methodologies, data analytics and machine learning, um, may not be ready off the shelf. And um, how do you know if that's happening? Have you ever taken a data set, collapse it down into a table of samples and features when it came from different scales, from different locations in space, with all kinds of a thick layer of geologic interpretation and engineering physics that was omitted? If you do that, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. We need to develop new methodologies that maximize the integration of this high value knowledge and data from the geosciences and the engineering. We need to have methodologies that are not focused on prediction accuracy, but on building good uncertainty models, because that's as critical to us in the subsurface. Love it. I wish I had thought about this. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Okay, Ben? You know, I'm going to kind of summarize, close this out, and why these kind of venues are so important. The word is Medcalf's Law. Why is Medcalf's Law so important to the energy industry and has been applied in other industry? So I will give anybody on this call $100 if you've been using the Simon phone from IBM from 1990 for the past 30 days. Why did the Simon IBM smartphone not work in the 1990s? because there was no collaboration. If there weren't other cell phones to communicate with, IBM's uh, Simon smartphone never took off. Why is this sto story so important? What you're doing today is satisfying Metcalf's law. That means you're connecting and the number one practice in data analytics, AI and software is what they call reuse. Reuse and using the intellectual capital that Dr. Perch has on all the books behind him, all the books behind here and everybody's knowledge in the room. Woodside Energy in your space will say, I use data analytics and AI to teach that machine how to think like an engineer. What is machine learning, artificial intelligence? They help us think like 10,000 engineers. Now, the challenge here, not only knowledge reuse and you guys satisfying Metcalf's law, you've got to a way figure out to figure out the data, the information, and the knowledge. Those are three different silos. All of us have data and we're flooded with data. Some of us have information, but we can't act on it knowledge actually put it into application. And that's where you're gonna to have to figure out as a group, is this knowledge 
relevant? Has it been validate, validated? And is it reliable to act on? I think in general, this industry and everybody in this room is going to have to satisfy Medcalf's law. And venues like this play a critical component of what we're going to be doing next year. Yes, definitely. Thank you very much for that, Ben. All right. I will say any final thoughts you guys would like to leave us with before we close up? Okay, I'll throw one thing in. And this is encouragement to those listening who are working professionals. You have great resources there to help you. As Ben said, you're more than halfway down the journey. We are the original data scientists. We, we can definitely learn these skills. I see many people who learn these skills and learn to fit them into our workflows to add additional value. I think this is all quite doable. We're in it together. Now, I saw a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, did you guys want to try to address that or take that offline? I think the uh, the plan was to go ahead and take those offline. So, okay. Uh, yeah, we'll definitely do that. Uh, what we're going to do, I'm sorry. Well, uh, if you if you look at the questions on the chat and you feel like there's one you'd like to answer, you're very welcome to. I'll give you a moment to look at those. Um, and while they're looking at those, um, I do want to say uh, thank you everyone for joining us. And uh, we will be having a our next webinar coming up, our next hybrid one as well. Um, it will be held at Midland College. And um, uh, look out for that. Also, to kind of tease uh, a major event for us coming up next year, uh, we will be having our first annual um, data analytics, data science conference uh, for the Permian area on April 25th and 26th. So please mark your calendars. Um, it'll be a two-day event uh, with a kickoff on a, a social event on Sunday, and we're very excited to have that. So um, Ben, Graciela, or Michael, uh, with any, any question you'd like to go ahead and address and answer? Um, you know, I guess we could all answer it. I, I did want to do one thing. One of the questions here on the lack of data acquisition on unconventional drilling, of course, the uh, uh, Graziella and Michael probably talked to that directly. But we did present last week at the Society of Petroleum Engineers annual tech and conference exhibition with Dr. Andre Popa from Chevron and Dr. Jeff Daniel from Lockheed Martin. They were addressing the lack of data. And again, it had a lot to do with the framework and the work products. I think that's available uh, to listen to, especially if you're a member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers. Again, it's the annual technical and exhibition conference 2021 in Dubai, but uh, they have an entire paper on that. But in my, anytime we lack data, it does work against AI. But uh, I'll let Michael and Graziella add to that. I, I can build on what Ben said by just making the statement that at some time, sometimes we're mixing ge like massively different geologic depositional settings. We're throwing everything into the hopper and we're trying to get AI to sort it out. And I don't think that's the answer. I think that's one of the first lines of defense with geologic interpretation is to ensure that we do break up the reservoir to distinctly different populations. And I think that improves the accuracy of all of our artificial intelligence and, and prediction methods. I will uh, answer the question with uh, um, an example of a project that I worked uh, in the past. Uh, I uh, was given some logs to analyze, and uh, the objective was to find uh, the saturation of uh, oil in these logs. And then uh, I had the logs and I had the labels, okay, uh, the, the real saturation. So uh, it was not a big amount of data. It was actually very uh, simple, like uh, just some logs as uh, uh, usually it is hard. We know it is hard to find the uh, good data. And then uh, uh, every model I tried, I would go so wrong, seriously. It was like I would be far from the label. I just couldn't create a good model. And then uh, after a while, trying many methodologies, I uh, I asked the, uh, uh, a domain person that uh, uh, was, uh, I mean, it, he was a friend and I was like, okay, what am I doing wrong here? And uh, he looked at the data and said, oh, 
but uh, this uh, the log that you are looking at uh, it's uh, from a time that uh, it was already drilled and already um, the oil was already extracted when uh, this log was taken. So I had one log that was a version uh, like of the 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 well already uh, drilled uh, already uh, uh, produced and the uh, the label was something that uh, uh, it was like a what it had before so i had different versions it would never match so uh, that's why i say that governance is so important and uh, uh, sometimes uh, we do lack information uh, but many times combining the data the many versions uh, uh what people did and uh the transformations that they did with the data uh this is also a big challenge all right thank you for that um any other questions you, you guys would like to answer if not we'll go ahead and close up yeah ronnie i'll try to i just got to notice that that pipe specification case study I'll try to get it over to you. If you can send a letter to Jeff Bates or Sarah, we can get that over to you. Uh, kind of at least the high level summary of how they used uh, machine learning for uh, pipe specification. Oh, that would be amazing. That sounds great. Thank you very much. And we will uh, go ahead and share that as well amongst the group. Uh, May I make a request to my co-panelists? Could I ask that um, if you're interested, could you smile here for a second? I'll take a picture and we'll we'll post this. I love that. I work with you all. Are you all good with that? All right. One, two, three, smile. Hey, that's great. Everybody looks good. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Once again, the recording will be available uh, afterwards once everything's downloaded. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you again, Michael, Ben, Graciela, for joining us today. We learned so much. This was such a great panel. And uh, we hope to see you guys again in the future. Y'all have a great afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.